this time on Graveyard Cars. The team is unleashed on a highly original 1970 Super B 383 air conditioning car in plum crazy. Rusted out and rotted, this massive reconstruction may be thwarted by the rarity of the necessary parts. We had to find the parts too. A lot of this stuff is unobtainium. Not to mention the naysayers on the team. I don't care nothing about it. You just want to knock that thing in the head. Oh, yeah, no, it's just too, uh, the third is just too rough. The third is a 383. It's not a 446 pack. Uh. Witness the remarkable rebuild with metal, a motor, and a malevolent marsupial. I never really understood what it meant. Will the return of Mark's latest pet project. What are you doing? Be the motivation Will needs to finally follow orders. All of Mark's jokes have gotten very old and redundant, so he's got to up it. Or will the pugilistic punishment not fit Will's crimes? It's like a prison sentence. Coming up on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Super B in Plum Crazy, one of five wild new high impact colors. High performance for the low dollar, that's Super B. This racing hood with hold down pins is optional. The new B stripe treatment. Now the Super B and the RT fly like a coconut in a hurricane. With their standard Magnum mills, the B's 383 and RT's 440. And if that ain't enough stuff under the hood, the sizzling 440 six-pack and Hell for Leather Hemi are optional on Super B and the RT. All right, so one of the cars that we're working on in the shop right now that we haven't introduced before is a 1970 Super B. A few years ago, was reached out to by the lady that owns it, she's the original owner. She had told me that her father had bought it for, I think it's a graduation gift, when she was in high school. I had her send me pictures of the car and I knew we were in trouble when I saw those pictures. It had been sitting in a makeshift barn kind of thing with center block foundation and plank flooring in it. So it wasn't a very good structure for it to rest in all those years. Well, eventually it fell down on it. And the only thing that was left was the car setting on this structure. It was real rusty and this one wasn't well preserved. It was rotten inside and out. It had already been partially disassembled. And so those are the harder ones for us to do. That's for sure. Now we ended up making a deal for the car to come out here and be restored. At the time I had my own horrible old tow truck that we sent back there to pick it up. And actually on the route to pick up that car, we grabbed the orange TA Challenger that is now the SEMA 22 car, which is kind of cool. Pictures are hard to tell much of anything. Like I say, I knew it was a, a mess when I did see the original pictures, but there's nothing quite like it when the car gets here and we're getting ready to disassemble it that you do your inventory. This car's rear frame rails, rear cross were so rotted out that the bumper fell off the car. It couldn't hold a bumper. Now, ironically, the finish panel, which is, they no longer produce that and they don't reproduce it, it was in pretty good shape. Tail lights were actually there and in good shape too, but pretty much everything on the back of the car was rotted. One nice thing was that the original white C-stripes were on it and they weren't in terrible shape. I believe they had never been masked off before, so that led me to believe it most likely was an original paint car, or at least most of it was. But that's the end of the good news. After that, you've got quarter panels rotted from the roof section, upper deck filler panel, all the way down through the quarters, the trunk floor extensions, the trunk floor, everything on the back half of the car was rotted. The door shells were completely rotted out. The rockers were rotted out. All the floors were rotted out. The fenders were rotted out. The hood was rotted out, everything. Now, what makes this really challenging is it's a 70 Coronet Super B. 
The fenders and the hoods are the ones that they use to make superbirds out of. So anybody building a tribute superbird would want good money for those fenders and for that hood. So we had to go on the hunt immediately to find good, tasty donor pieces so we could put that car back together. So this is not an N96 Ram Charger. This is not, this is a standard bulge hood, which has two little scoops or scallops in it and calls out Super B on the side of it. Real, real nice looking hood, but not the most highly option of the hoods that you could have had. So these cars that have original vinyl tops like this one, usually the top is destroyed. That's okay. We replace them. We get brand new ones from our friends at Classic. No problem. It's the roof underneath it that was rotted on this one. So it's, it ended up needing a roof skin. The front and the back glass channels were also rotted on it. However, all these bad things I'm saying about the car, it is a beautiful combination originally. I would have loved to have seen it new. Plum crazy, white top, white interior, white C-stripe be really gorgeous. It's just too bad to see it like this. On the interior, the only thing that was even presentable was the dash assembly and the headliner, which of course they're out of kind of the way of things, so they will tend to survive sometimes. It is a Super B, so it gets the wood grain rally instrument cluster, and that's all in pretty good shape and intact. It's really not a highly optioned car on the inside. White bucket seat buddy seat, which is the fold down armrest in the middle automatic on the column, but it is an air conditioning car, so that's a good thing. So when I wiped off the odometer area of the dash, I could see that it had 72,000 original miles on it. So that just tells you that whenever that car was parked, which I have a feeling was in the late 70s, perhaps early 80s, it had been driven 72,000 miles by that time, but that was the last it was on the road before you see it like this. Now, if you go back to uh, season seven, episode five of Graveyard Cars, Graveyard Classics available on YouTube, you can see that Tony and I actually inventoried that car. We went around several cars. We were doing little mini uh, validations on a few cars, especially the original ones. This particular car uh, was very, very original, just really, really bad shape. We were able to validate the original fender tag on it the options that it did have. They all matched what was left on the car. We looked at some date codes on some different parts to make sure they hadn't been changed out. And at the end of the day, we were able to come up with the fact that this is a very original 1970 Super B 383 automatic air conditioning car. Uh, look under here, we've got the original fender tag, the original emission uh, decal, mm. which I think is kind of cool. There's not a lot on the tag. It's not heavily loaded, but you see it is white interior, white top, C-stripe, and um, a bench seat, which is kind of unusual. I would have liked to have seen a pair of buckets in it. But at the same time, it's also an automatic on the column, which is kind of a right a downer. You know, throughout time, I always like bucket seats because they're cool. Right. But for sitting and riding in the yep, car, I agree. A bench. Again, the old man thing. Yeah. The, a little bit nice. older. You got to find half a dozen, a dozen items or more. Uh, the control arms are dated. The yep, lower they control are. arms yeah. are dated. The K member is dated also. Right. And and those are I dates. I mentioned that already, though. You said K frame? Oh, you did? I didn't hear you say that. It happens. Are you sure? Okay, cool breeze. You know, I'm gonna have to go see a therapist because I'm looking back through that season seven, episode five, and, and he, he even ruffles my feathers now, just watching him ruffle my feathers in. It, it's part of it, he's got a sickness. There was a guy that used to be on the show years ago that liked to wind me up a little bit. Remember that guy? You, you remember him, buddy? Sorry, Tony. So one of the things Tony and I talked about after we looked over the car and validated it, was how important it is that you store a car properly. If you know someday you'd like to drive it and someday you'd like to restore it and it means something to you, and I believe that these cars do mean something, you've seen it multiple times, preserve it the best you can, cover it. Let it breathe in the summer, cover it in the winter with a tarp, put it in a garage. If you don't have a garage, find some way of keeping it safe. Dry it out occasionally, put the mothballs inside it to absorb moisture, do what you can to try to preserve it. This is just a good example of what happens if you don't take those necessary steps. So anyway, that's that's cool stuff that you gotta know if you're working on these things. But the overall condition of the car is rough. Yes, right? yeah. It's very, very rough. It's got a lot of rust in it. Not abused, but had a bad- Parked. Right. The, worst, the worst kiss of death in the world is parking a car. People don't understand that. They think going out and hot rodding it and burning out and sliding around. That's great. That keeps the car moving. All right. You park them underneath the tree, you set them out in the barn and let the barn collapse on them. Like that's what happened with this one. They rot. Now, one of the things that I had talked to Tony, Mr. Heartless, 
about back in the day we were going around these cars was do you restore it or don't you we were making decisions we had done that on a daytona and a couple other cars in the past and it was kind of kind of informative for the people so we did that at the time and of course he wants to knock it in the head i understand why people keep cars yeah. because they have future plans for it or it's sentimental but if they're not keeping it in good storage they're ruining the they're car. ruining the car so anybody that's out there that has a car stored get it i agree and, and save it in, in a good place so the real question then at that point is you know what the end value of this car is you know about what it costs to have graveyard cars restore one do you restore this car do you not restore this car you don't care nothing about it you just want to knock that thing in the head oh yeah no it's just too uh, that there is just too rough that there is a 383 it's not a 446 pack uh, that there was a hemi maybe you know but that there's nothing well it isn't nothing it, it isn't nothing don't Okay, Mark, first of all, like usual, you got all your facts wrong. Yes, I did say that based on the fact that it was in really bad shape and only a 383 automatic car, that if you asked me, I wouldn't restore it. But you then pointed out that the car is an original owner car and that, of course, it has sentimental ties to the owner. So at that point, I agreed that it, it, it's justified restoring that car. And you know, Mark, an interesting point. Dodge never offered a convertible Super B in any year. Dodge also never offered a Super B hardtop. Now, while Mr. Heartless did want to knock the old girl on the head, um, Heartless, cold stuff, cold, mean cold. Anyway, it's not his decision, thank goodness. It's my decision, and I decided we would restore the car, which brings us to where we are today. When we got that car back from the dipper, it was every bit as bad or worse than I had suspected. Some of the things that we ended up having to replace, I thought when I first looked at them, we wouldn't, but we did. So for those of you who want to nerd out, we ended up replacing both front frame rails, both inner fenders, inner fender to firewall baffles, firewall side sections, left and right, the right and left inner and outer rockers, the main floor, transmission cross member, rear step wells, left and right, under seat pan. We had to do patches in the quarters, inner structures, replace the left and the right inner and outer wheelhouses, both quarters, trunk floor, trunk floor extensions, Dutchman panel, and approximately 50 to 75 small patches on panels that we were able to save. Pretty much every piece of sheet metal that you could imagine or inner structure had to be replaced on that car. Because of all the work that had to be done on that car, it spent over a year in the metal shop. And that's not just because it takes that long to do it, but we had to find the parts too. A lot of this stuff is unobtainium. Finding those fenders in that hood are not easy, and you really have to have them on there before you do a lot of the infrastructure work because you use those to square the car. On the 383 for the 1970 Super B, it was really rusty from sitting all those years. Everything was there from the air cleaner to the entire air conditioning system. Even the original exhaust manifolds were there. This makes my job so much easier because I don't have to go on a scavenger hunt looking for all the pieces to put this thing back together. Since this was the original numbers matching engine and transmission, we had to make sure we did everything we could to save them. Since the cylinders in this engine were so rusty, we had to bore this thing 60 thousandths over and put in new forged pistons. We bored the mains 10 thousandths over and the rods the same, and we built out the rest of the engine just the way we always do. So we had the machine shop do a three angle valve job on these heads with bronze guides and hardened seats. So the rotating assembly was fully balanced. The top of the block was decked very carefully so as to save the original engine stampings. Once we had the engine built out, we ran it on the engine run stand, and then we handed it off to Will for paint. Once I got the transmission back from the shop, I was able to restore it and all the components so that we could install it in the car. 9.04 p.m. Decoy vehicle now in position. That cocky thing will be able to resist this one. Brand new Dodge Cornet. It ain't expensive, but it sure do look it. We gonna get him this time. <laughs> hey, JW, that you over yonder? Do for me, you be quiet. Shit. Somebody left the keys in a car over here. That's a good way to get it stolen. Buford, hush, that's a whole idea. Hey, it's a brand new Dodge Coronet. Ain't that pretty? Buford, will you get? It's snazzy inside, too. Boy, it's big. Hey, is that all they cost? 
Hey, J.W., I'll be you. Would go wait in the squad car. Okay, J.W. Hey, where'd it go? The beautiful new Dodge Coronet. A value so irresistible, you can't afford not to be Dodge material. Black and white, red light on top. Stop laughing, Clarence. <laughs> So I finally get to black out the AAR, which I'm super excited about because it's the first one I've done, and then it enters freckles. And this is what I was afraid of. If Mark gets a laugh or a reaction, then he just beats the gag completely to death. And that's fine. Mark's 60, 65 years old. If this is what it comes down to, that's fine. But I'm not gonna sit here and say, I didn't see this coming. The pageantry involved now was way different than what it was in season four. I mean, probably because he has more money, so he can buy saxophones, he can buy freckles. You know, it's a little more violent. Before it was just signs, you know, that gave you that threat, but now it's an actual animal in house to give you that threat. All of Mark's jokes have gotten very old and redundant. So he's got to up it. And because now he has a little more income coming in, he can up it with the pageantry now, which is a whole new level, which is gonna last another 10 years. So he's gonna be like 70 years old and it's gonna be like freckles with a walker. That's the next thing. Now on our little AAR, our EF8 uh, green AAR, it came out beautiful. Will finally, after a little bit of influence, got the blackout done on the tops of the fenders, the hood, top of the door, and tops of the quarters. Now that matte black against that green, while you think it's not a lot of contrast, when you actually see them done, is beautiful. It's gonna be just a stunning car, especially when the black strobe stripe goes down on it. But the reason I was in a hurry, because we have the drivetrain done and ready to install and that's why I pushed everything on it. Once we got it out of the paint shop, Doug and I knocked that out. We got the engine transmission rear in, everything installed in the car so that it could become a roller. And now that it's a roller, it can go through the rest of the shop and get assembled and back to the guy that owns it, who's been very patient with us. So after the metal work was done, we kicked it over to the mud shop. Mud did a great job. It went really quickly through there. After that, they were able to hand it off over to Will and he could start doing his magic. So in typical fashion, we got the car all blocked out, made sure it was dialed in. At that point, we were able to disassemble it and get going on the jams. So right now is what I'm doing is if you prep the car, I let you jam the car. So that way I can get Brody spraying more and I have my new helper, Count Chocula, spraying at the same time so they can develop their skills at an even pace. Count came to us with a pretty good basic skill set, so I had no problems cutting him loose on jam work. It's just fine tuning a few things, but all in all, both guys are doing a great job. I've been doing more and more painting of the jams here and it's going really well. It's the first time painting the FC7 Plum Crazy. Will told me it takes about six coats to hide and about two coats to finesse. It's a really nice color, especially with the metallics. The clear I use is the same clear that Will uses, which is a PPG 2021 polyurethane clear. The thing I noticed about this product is that it's really thick, so when you spray it, you gotta really give it time in between coats to let all the solvents come out and let it breathe. So when it came to the jam work on this, we treat the jams just like the outside of the car. They need to be that nice. Anthony did a phenomenal job spraying the Plum Crazy. Looks great. So when it came time for Anthony to do the color, he did the DBC 2210, which is the brand code that PPG uses for Plum Crazy. Sprayed that, everything looked great. Chocula is doing a great job. I, I love the guy. He shows up on time. He stays late if you need him to, which he did multiple times for us. He follows orders. That's a good thing, right? I ask him to do something, he does it. That's why him and Freckles get along great. You know, Freckles respects people who respect the code. 
They're besties, man. You see those two guys together, they're hanging out all the time, eating lunch. They're friends. And that just shows it can be done. So on a bee body, most circumstances, we do the body color and we do it black. With this car having white interior, inside of the doors instead of black needs to go white to match the interior. So we use the EW1, which is a white single stage. So Anthony goes in there, sprays all the purple, comes in the next day, masks everything off, and then sprays the single stage white down. So when those doors are put on, it matches that white interior and trim panels, very nice. So once all the jam work was completed and everything looked great, I had my team put the car back together, start getting the car ready for final paint. Good morning, sweetheart. Uh, haven't we stopped yet, Ferris? Just in to fill up. <laughs> Whoopee. Man, what a wedding present. Yeah. Dodge Coronet wagon. Don't even have to lower the window to open the back door. Uh, aren't you getting a little tired of driving, darling? Tired? As comfortable as this baby is? And notice how the optional wind vane keeps the rear window clean. Hey, there's a nice place. I'm telling you, our house should be this plush. Ferris, I'm hungry. Sure, honey. Take a look back there. That deck's wide enough to hold paneling. Over four by eight feet. Hey, why waste money? We could just... Ferris, you wouldn't. New Coronet Crestwood Wagon. With this much wagon, at this low price, you can't afford not to be Dodge material. Ferris, put down the owner's manual and turn out the light. With this car and this color, I put one coat of sealer on just just to make sure. My guys are pretty thorough. I don't feel like I even need to, but just to be safe, one coat of sealer that'll cover maybe a 320 or 400 scratch that got missed. It ensures that that won't be a problem as we go on. Once the sealer's on there, I let it sit for about 45 minutes. Then at that point, I walk around the car, look for maybe a missed pinhole or anything that could cause a problem later so I can address it now. At that point, we go in with our color. And with this color, it seems like it would cover quick, but it's, it's good, good five coats and then two drop coats to make sure the metallic lays out good. So I do about seven coats, probably 20 minutes, depends on the temperature, about 70 degrees uh, in between each coat, give it good flash time. And then after that process is done, we can start the clear coat process, which is still our three coats, about 20 minutes, 30 minutes in between each coat. Then I'm done, close it up, everything looks good, another car painted. You know, if I'm left alone with no silliness and we know at home, what the silliness is. Um, so uninterrupted, you're looking at about four hours to get the color completely done. But uninterrupted has never, never happened. I mean, this car behind me, I was clearing it yesterday. Yesterday. We'd already did our filming. I did everything Pete asked me to do. Everybody left. I'm in there painting. Before you know it, I got this guy staring through the, through the window. Just watch him. What I want to know is why you're not yeah. doing it on the roof. We just talked about this on the green car, right? Remember the whole thing about the green car? Yeah. Didn't cut. Why aren't you putting color up there? Well, a couple things. Okay. First of all, I'm like right in the middle of a paint job. And I understand that. And, and I understand all the... Is that a dirt spec? He can threaten me all he wants with his craziness and costumes. The great thing about Mark in 30 days, he's not gonna remember any of it. Secondly, factory didn't even have color on roofs that got vinyl tops. So this is where I would have listened to Mark. It's his shop, his paint, his rules. That's why I get along great with him. I told you about this on the green car. I want to pretend like it's never, ever going to get a vinyl top. It's never going to get blacked out. But with the green car, I talked to the customer. He assured me that we were doing. Listen, I'm a creature of habit, okay? I do things the same way. I put my shoes and my wallet and my keys in the exact same spot. I'm a creature of habit. That's how I survive. 
Also, I just like things done my way. That's one of the advantages of being the boss. Yeah, but, but I've worked with customers before and they change their minds. And yeah, good. this is actually an all original car and it gets a black vinyl top with black interior and white doors. And she loved that option and she wants to maintain that look. So I know that we are keeping the vinyl top. you ever top. see the Lethal Weapon franchise? Yeah, yeah heck yeah. Great series, right? All of them. So you, people say, why is it going these crazy references to movies and, and make all these threats? And what's up with this Freckles thing? Well, it's to make him learn. It's just a different type of thing. I'm willing to take the time to help him learn. You can use scenarios from movies to learn from, right? All right, remember Marathon Man? Is it safe? Is it safe? You know, and he drilled a hole in the front of his tooth. Why didn't you just answer if it was safe? I believe it's in Lethal Weapon 2, where Roger's taking a Cleveland steamer on the toilet, and he calls, Mel Gibson shows up because he did the bomb squad. Right, the bomb squad yeah. thing, right? Do you remember that whole exchange between two friends? Yeah. So he says, okay, we're gonna go one, two, three, and go. And then Mel Gibson needs the clarification. You right. mean one, two, and then go, go on, on three? three. Or yeah. one, two, three, and go. Yeah. They didn't do that for, for experience. They did it because they needed to coordinate what the other person wanted. Gotcha. This is what I meant when I talked about four hours uninterrupted. It doesn't happen. It's strictly just Mark and his silliness. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. See, he didn't want his nutsack turned into sushi. When Makes that sense. Toilet yeah, because that's up, right? right there. Do you want to pick your balls up off of the wall? No. So one, two, three, go, or one, two, three, go. Right. It's important. Paint on the roof keeps your balls from ending up up here. So I'll expect some paint on the roof. You know, after all the silliness was done, I was able to get the car done. The car looks great. And you guys at home see what I deal with. And I know you guys. You guys have to believe this because I know when we go to see Mark car shows or other places, number one question is Mark really like that? It, it's yes, yes, this is day to day for 27 years. It's like a prison sentence. Stay tuned. Bad news for the ghouls force Mark and Dougie to embark on a dark journey into a graveyard car's past. The closer we got, the harder it started raining. To rescue an old friend from a dire situation. And as we got closer, it got darker and darker. From an old resurrection. They're coming back to life, Mark. To Will's current insurrection. Still not gonna do it. How far can Mark be pushed? The great thing about Mark in 30 days, he's not gonna remember any of it. Before threats escalate to violence. Paint on the roof keeps your balls from ending up up here. When Graveyard Cars returns. This 1969 Roadrunner was built with a high-performance 383 engine and an automatic transmission. It was also built with an RM23 two-door hardtop, a white interior, and white top on the inside. It is one of the rarest birds here at the shop, and it also happens to be the subject of this week's autopsy report. So remember folks, we read a fender tag left to right, bottom to top. E63, that's gonna be a high performance 383 engine. D32, three speed automatic torque flight transmission. RM23, that's the first four digits of the vehicle identification number. It also means that this is a two door hardtop Roadrunner model. H9G, H means it's a 383, Nine represents the year, so in this case, 1969. G represents the assembly plant, which in this case is St. Louis, Missouri. 293831, that's the serial number, which is unique to this car. R4, bright red exterior paint. R4, bright red roof paint. M6W, that's vinyl bucket seats in white. W1, that's upper door frame paint in white. 620, that's gonna be the scheduled production date. And in this case, it is June 20th, 1969. 334234, that's gonna be the shipping order number. C55, bucket seats. 
J25 three speed wipers, M21 drip rail molding, R22 AM music master radio with an eight track, V1W white vinyl top, E6W white longitudinal stripe. 26, 26 inch max cooling radiator, which is very unusual for a non-AC, non-towing package and a non-axle package car. And that's the end of this sales code and end of this week's autopsy report. Keep on it. So anyway, Mr. Evans. Easy. When I showed you this new Dodge custom swept line. Yeah, love it. Mr. Evans, I, I made a terrible mistake in the price. <gasps> I knew it. You didn't charge enough. Oh, no. I charge too much. Too much? <laughs> Push what I got on it? Home seats, power brakes, automatic transmission. That's it. What? Automatic <gasps> transmission. What about it? You paid for it. Of course I paid for it. <laughs> But this specially equipped custom swept line comes with an automatic transmission at no extra charge. It's a special Dodge package. Saves you more than $247. $247? Hey, Wallace! The new custom swept line automatic special. See it today at the Dodge Boys. Hey, Wallace, 247 bucks. Now, I love Frankenhurst. I built that car years ago. For those of you who've watched the show for many, many years, will remember Frankenhurst from the pilot episode. This was all for this epic trailer for the show. I, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I just wanted to make something cool. So I built a 1968 Cadillac hearse, but it couldn't be a Cadillac powered hearse, right? Because people would, would mutiny on me. So we ended up taking the 500 and some cubic inch, maybe it was a 500 cubic inch Cadillac engine and transmission out of it and I adapted a 440 Magnum in it. Rebuilt a 30 over, I think, mile camshaft, put a tunnel ram dual fours on it. And we used that many times in that original opener, uh, the original cold open that it was, and trailer that it was for graveyard cars. Frankenhurst has been with me since 08 when I first built the car, but we haven't used it. You haven't seen it now in probably 200 episodes. It was only used in the first couple, I think. It's been stored down at our friend Chuck's place, uh, Springfield Auto Recyclers. You guys recall Springfield Auto Recyclers is where we held a paintball challenge back in the early days, I think season two or three. We were all down there and it was a great place. He had all classic cars and he sold stuff off all over the world. He, he had discovered eBay and that's how he was making a living after he shut down the main collision type of recycling yard. After 10 years of setting there, Chuck called me up and said he was retiring. Thank goodness for him. Good for him. I'm glad that he did. But that we had to get the car out of there. So I remember Frank and Hurst from when Mark first built that car. And after seeing it sitting in the wrecking yard all those years, I was really excited to get it out. I'll tell you something, uh, you know, this is an interesting thing. So it was a decent day when we started out and decided that we were going to run down and grab the car. And you remember in the Munsters when whenever there was always rain and clouds over the house itself, no matter how nice it was everywhere else, it was raining outside the house. That was a great bit. Well, I think Frankenhurst borrowed a little branch from that tree because while we took off and it was nice weather, the closer we started getting down to pick up the car at the wrecking yard, 
the more it started raining. The closer we got, the harder it started raining. Now, Doug, he's simpleton. He loves this stuff because he loves monster movies. I'm not so thrilled because I know I got to be out in it. But literally, as we were pulling up to that place, the skies opened up and really let go. So when we left the shop, it was dry out and sunny. And as we got closer, it got darker and darker. And this was like a lot of old movies I've seen. It was right up my alley. So like I say, as we got closer and closer to the wrecking yard, it was really starting to pound. The rain was coming down. It began to thunder. It was lightning. Now, these are all great signals, right? Now, the average person would have took those signals, turned around and gone back. But I asked Dougie, he says, no, no, this is great. This is perfect weather. This is my weather. And why is it his weather? Because he's kind of like Frankenstein. He loves those old monster movies. I do too, but I realize they're movies. He wants to live them. He wants to go out into some graveyard and dig up an old body and try to reanimate it. I don't understand what is happening with that man. All I know is he, so I guess technically he's my Igor or Igor. I heard your name was Igor. No, it's Igor. I changed it. Hmm. So you changing your name to Froderick? No, it's Frederick. <laughs> Froderick. <laughs> That's young Frankenstein. I love the old monster movies, and so does Mark. I don't know what he was complaining about. I thought it was a beautiful day to pick up Frank and Hearst. When we finally got out there, it's not surprising that one of the tires was flat. Frankly, I'm surprised they weren't all flat. What was a little surprising is I found myself in the middle of a graveyard, digging up an old hearse with thunder and lightning, pretty much all the worst scenes of the Bible you can imagine, all the things from Revelation. Look, I'm not a 1930s monster movie. I'm a human being. Dougie loves this stuff. Yeah, see him out there. He's just like that Igor Igor dude. He's happy. It's raining down on him. It's thunder. It's lightning. He's miserable and he's happy. He's happy. That is whack. Once we got air in the tire and got it hooked up, I noticed Mark seemed to lighten up a little bit. <laughs> oh, hi, boys. Gondars! Gondars! So I noticed Marcus started to bring Gondars back again. I never really understood what it meant. But if it makes Mark happy and calm, then I guess it makes me happy and calm. And now here's the thing about Gondars. I love old Gondars. It's from the movie I Spy. That was the bad guy in I Spy. Remember when Eddie Murphy was, was talking to him and he said, Mr. Gondar. <laughs> and he does that little laugh afterwards. You're a real player, Mr. Ganda. <laughs> I love that. So I adapted it. I, I hadn't used it in probably a season or two now. And I was down there and I just felt like given the circumstances, uh, things were, were odd down there that I just throw out a Gondars and try to bring some familiarity to the scene. Is that, is that bad? Whoa, it's about ready to pull that bumper off there. The bumper's coming off? Yeah, it, something broke loose in there and the whole thing rolled up like this and it went back. Yeah. Uh, All right. Frankenhurst. Why doesn't it say Frankenhurst? They're coming back to life, Mark.
still to come. Will didn't follow an order again. Will's insubordination may finally push Mark to his breaking point. Follow orders or men die, it's that simple. But if Mark's threats fall on deaf ears. If he thinks I want to be intimidated by a kangaroo, it's Mark. Will Mark's only option be resorting to violence? It was disturbing. And calling in the thunder from down under. Yeah, that. I know exactly what's going through my mind. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. While I was gone, I left specific instructions that I wanted Brian to get the car out of the paint shop as soon as it was kicked off and put the drivetrain in it so that we could make it mobile, which we did. I come back from that literal haunted house, walk by the car, which Brian did his job. He put everything in it like he was supposed to, only to find out that Will didn't follow an order again. That's right. I specifically asked him to make sure that that roof got painted and I'm looking at a roof that is gray primer. You know what I'm saying? Imagine my surprise when I walk by the car after surprise. Brian gets the drivetrain in it. I'm out in the, the wet and the sleet and the hail and the snow picking up Frankenhurst and I come back to see this. Actually, Doug was. Well, I was out there too. You drove it. Yes. Why don't you not deflect and worry more about why I don't see purple paint on that roof? The same reason I gave you last time. Yeah, but I told you, and you didn't. So keeping the millage low is key. You know what else is key? Huh, Cool Breeze? Following orders. Follow orders or men die. It's that simple. Jack Nicholson, that is from a few good men, and it's a fact. So is what I started doing is, why take all the extra purple to put on this roof when Because the covered? boss asked you to. <laughs> but the boss doesn't understand how real this problem is. So I have a bunch of leftover paint, so next time, we're doing this color, I have materials from this car and this car. So it's fair so. to say you didn't learn anything from Freckles. <laughs> Him and Freckles, man. If he thinks I'm gonna be intimidated by a kangaroo, I mean, really, I know who's underneath there, it's Mark. Why are we, do why are we talking about Freckles still? Why can we move on past Freckles? See, look at what he's done to you, Pete. He's literally taking quality questions, throwing them all out the door, and it's all about Freckles. It's all about Mark again, got it. What's against what I asked for? You told me to put color on that roof. I chose not right? to. Just like the AAR, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. But I did that to protect you. Yeah. So I noticed that you did do the AAR blackout after Freckles took care of business and explained to you how it had to be done. Well, I didn't take care of it. It was disturbing. Yeah. Why don't you so, hold that thought for just yeah. one minute? Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. How come? Yeah, that. I know exactly what's going through my mind. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Oh God, what do you want? Stop, but later, stop, stop. it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness okay, that's to good, those that's good. who have been trained by it. We're fine, okay, that's enough. That's enough. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. <laughs> 